The ancient distrust, rivalry, and hostility between the old Swiss Confederacy and the House of Habsburg, which had risen to the throne of the Holy Roman Emperor from 1438, only escalated their disdain further. Since the late 13th century, the members of the Swiss Confederacy had gradually taken control of territories that once had belonged to the Habsburg realm, and were ever so slowly doing more and more damage to the Holy Roman Empire, which garnered a rather large amount of attention. The Swiss had also succeeded in defending their privileged status on multiple occasions against Habsburg dukes who had tried to regain their former territory, and were not afraid to do so again. Moving on to the 15th century, and with Swiss power radiating outwards from the heart of Western Europe, following the defeat of Burgundy during the Burgundian Wars, many find it a curiosity that the old Swiss Confederation did not join the ranks of the emerging European powers. In truth, the old Swiss Confederacy still lacked a coherent voice in matters of foreign affairs unless threatened by foreign influence. Swiss patricians chose to elect a policy of armed caution and prudence until the right opportunity presented itself. In 1488, the Swabian League was introduced. It was a mutual defense and peacekeeping association of imperial states and provinces within the Swabian regions of the empire under the discretion of Emperor Frederick III of Austria. The growing power of the Wittelsbach dynasty in Bavaria alarmed the Habsburgs, who feared they might make an alliance with the French or the Old Swiss Confederation. Austria sent diplomatic overtures to the Old Swiss Confederation in the hope that they would join the League. Nevertheless, the Swiss believed the Swabian League was directed against them. They defiantly refused to join the Swabian League in 1488, and they later ignored the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian's request to adhere to a set of imperial reforms established at the Diet of Worms in 1495 which would have consolidated Austrian legal and economic powers throughout Switzerland. The fact that the Swiss extended their military agreements with Charles VIII of France and received a great deal of income from the French crown in the form of pension caused even more concern in Vienna. When the old Swiss Confederation signed a treaty of mutual cooperation and alliance with the three leagues of Graubünden in 1497, it worsened an already delicate situation. Swiss deceit and perceived arrogance annoyed the Austrians and their Swabian allies alike, who waited for the perfect moment to strike the Swiss and their allies. In order to safeguard Austrian interests in Tyrol and Milan, Maximilian sought to project power into the great Alpine passes and along Lake Constance. This greatly unnerved those living in eastern Switzerland, and relation between the three leagues of Graubünden and the eastern Swiss cantons grew even closer. In early 1499, Tyrolean forces took the prized valley of Munster, which was a strategic artery between Austria and Milan. The Austrian incursion into Graubünden was quickly defeated, but not before the Austrians sacked Muster and severely damaged the Benedictine Abbey of St. John. Open fighting broke out in an arc of war, which extended from Alsace in the west to South Tyrol in the east. Although Maximilian I had called upon German states within the Holy Roman Empire to help him come and fight the Swiss, Tyrolians and Swabians made up the majority of his troops. Maximilian I faced difficulties in assembling and paying his troops, which made a unified war effort against the Old Swiss Confederation an extraordinarily difficult and costly endeavor. Swiss raids far into Imperial and Swabian territories provided plenty of plunder and capital to satisfy Swiss soldiers, and after Bern's initial reluctance to participate in the war, all ten Swiss cantons fielded men who fought together in alongside soldiers from the three leagues. France's new king, Louis XII, ever eager to prevent German unity within the Holy Roman Empire, provided critical funds to the Swiss. The Swiss won six major victories in rapid succession. Hard, Bruderholz, Swaterloo, Frastans, Calvin, and Dornach. The Swiss believed they could win the war by resisting enemy attack upon the Swiss Middleland. They maintained strategic communication lines with scouts in Jura and along the Rhine River, which kept them well informed of Swabian and Austrian movements. Swiss fortitude and resourcefulness won international praise even from the Austrians and Swabians, but the ferocity of the fighting led to untold losses on both sides. One estimate puts that 200 villages were burned and 20,000 people were killed on both sides of the Rhine River in the first six months of 1499. 
tens of thousands of civilians died, many because of starvation, and Switzerland, Swabia, and Tyrol swelled with refugees. Plague broke out in the regions most ravaged by the war, adding to the already staggering losses. Following the Battle of Dornach, Maximilian I realized his attempts to subdue the Swiss were doomed to failure. After seven months of intense warfare along the borders, the Austrians and Swabians were exhausted and low on arms. Swiss resistance had won the war, but the Swiss too were ready to negotiate a peace treaty. The Treaty of Basel, signed on September 22, 1499, absolved the Swiss from imperial jurisdiction and taxes from Austria. The Swabian War of 1499 was to be the last major armed conflict between Switzerland and Austria. Relations between Austria and the old Swiss Confederation returned to the status quo ante, and the Austrians accepted the territorial integrity of the Three Leagues of Graubünden as well. Maximilian dropped the traditional Habsburg claims to Swiss territories. This augmented Swiss autonomy via the other German states within the Holy Roman Empire. While it is true that the Swiss remained nominally part of the Holy Roman Empire, they never complied with imperial decisions ever again. The compromise worked well for the Swiss and Austrians, and European powers would recognize total Swiss independence in 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia. The Swabian War marked the first time that two opposing armies deployed formations of pikemen fighting each other. The end result was savage, and it was a sign of things to come in the upcoming Italian wars during 1494 to 1559. The Swabian League remained an active political force only until 1534, when its members became divided over the Protestant Reformation. Nonetheless, the fierce rivalry between Swabians and the Swiss would continue well into and beyond the 16th century, and Swabian losses in 1499 would inspire a new generation of fighters eager to fight the Swiss. Fortune's wheels spun in a new direction. The Swabian forces would fight and prevail against the Swiss at the Battle of Marignano, the Battle of Bekoka, and the Battle of Pavia. Unknown to many is the fact that the Swabian War marked a major shift in the history of artillery. Under the command of Maximilian I, Austria would make significant advancements in unified caliber and barrel length during the war. Artillery thus became more accurate and able to cover greater distances, making war a deadlier prospect to Swiss mercenaries wielding pikes and halberds on the battlefields of Europe. These technological innovations marked the beginning of the end of the Swiss pikemen's heyday. Thank you for watching this Everything History video. We hope you enjoyed the video, or at least learned a thing or two. What do you make of the Swabian War, and what would you like to see next on the channel? Let us know in the comments below.